ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce you our second plenary speaker. She is a very good friend. Uh, I will read something, but everybody knows already Leslie, so it will be quite useless, but uh, it is uh, the moment to tell you all of you that Leslie Ben Seals is a professor emerita at Tel Aviv University. She serves uh, on the editorial boards of uh, Engineering Fracture Mechanics, uh, International Journal of Fracture, International Journal of Structural Integrity and Engineering Failure Analysis. Uh, among the awards uh, she re received uh, is the Teaching of Excellence uh, Award in Mechanical Engineering in 1999 and uh, uh, Honorary Doctorate from Lund University in 2014. <laughs> a lifetime achievement award from Eurosum in 2018 and the Griffith Medal from ASIS in 2020. You will soon receive Leslie this medal. Her research interests include the use of analytical, numerical, experimental methods to treat fracture problems, which include homogeneous materials, bonds, interfaces, and composites. In particular, recently she and her group have been examining the propagation of the lamination in cross-ply and woven composites. She has participated in over 100 international conferences and been on the scientific committees of many of them. She has guided over 50 masters, PhD, and postdoctoral, doctoral, postdoctoral students. Many of them hold a key position in academia and industry. She has published over 120 papers in international journals and two books. The last is Interface Fracture and Laminations in Composite Materials, Spindler, the Netherlands, 2018. In Google Scholar, she has 4,538 citations and an H index, H index of 39. From 2008 until 2016, she was a member of the Congress Committee of International Union of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics. She was elected to the Executive Committee of the Congress Committee in 2016. In 2006, she was elected as one of the two Vice Presidents of ASIS and served, as we all well know, as President from 2010 and 2018. In addition, she was uh, a vice president of Erosam from 2008 and 2018. Finally, since 2017, she is the treasurer of the International Congress of Fracture. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce you, Leslie Banksis. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and I want to just congratulate you on being a fantastic president for the last four years of ESIS, and I wish Good luck to, and I know he will do a fantastic job. Alexander Sednak will do an excellent job as president for the next four years. So today, I'd like to talk to you about some work which we have been carrying out at the Dresher Fraction Mechanics Laboratory at Tel Aviv University on modeling the contribution of fiber bridging in unidirectional composites. And this work was carried out together with my PhD student Ben Bohr, who is now, now writing on her thesis. So this will be on her, her work. So I'll talk about the motivation, and then we'll talk about fiber bridging in mode one, and I'll mention the material. And we carry out quasi-static testing. So I'll talk about the experimental methods and results, a cohesive zone model, the numerical model and results coming from finite elements with the cohesive zone model. And we're going to, the aim of this work is to separate out the contribution of fiber bridging, and I'll say something about it in a, another slide, from, from the energy release rate. And then we're gonna do the same thing with fatigue testing, mode one fatigue testing. So it's, it's the same thing. And then we'll head off to summary and conclusions. So our motivation is that Composites are being used um, a lot. They, they have uh, great benefits. And for aircraft, they, um, uh, they significantly uh, add to fuel savings, weight reduction, fatigue and corrosion resistance, and extended, extended in-service life. And for example, for the uh, Airbus A350, uh, the airplane body is made up of 53% by weight of composites. 
And the Boeing 787 is also made up of about 50% weight of composite. So both their fuselages are composite laminates. So composite laminates are, are very important for us, but one of the problems when we test fiber bridging occurs in deep type specimens in the lab. And so a portion of the load is carried by the bridging fibers, which increases the apparent fracture toughness. And unfortunately, uh, because it, it, uh, it adds to the fracture toughness, but it adds to the fracture toughness only in the lab, usually, except for um, uh, some um, wind, wind blades, um, fiber bridging is not observed in, in those structures. So you have it in the specimens that you're testing, but you don't have it in the structures that, that are using the same material. So what we want to do is we want to estimate the effect of fiber bridging on the energy release rate in both quasi-static and fatigue loading, and to eliminate its contributions to get the net fracture toughness and, and the net um, uh, fatigue delamination propagation pro uh, properties. So to predict the response in mode one, we're going to use a cohesive zone model uh, from a standard double cantilever beam. And the material that we're using is a laminate, and it comes, uh, as you can see on the right, as a prepreg. And it's made of AS4 carbon fibers, which is embedded in an epoxy matrix. The epoxy is 8552. There are 16 plies in the specimen. The fiber volume, volume fraction is approximately 60%. Uh, the material is unidirectional and all fibers are aligned in the axial direction. So let's look at quasi-static testing. Here's our DCB specimen. And as I said, it's made of a carbon epoxy AS4-8552. The nominal dimensions, the length is approximately 200 millimeters. The width is 20 millimeters and the height of the specimen is three millimeters. And the initial delamination length was between 33.8 and 44.3. We measure it from the center of the load holes. And this is not in keeping with ASTM and ESOs, ESO. Uh, it should be about 50 to 55 millimeters, but these are the specimens that we received from Hexel, from actually from TC Arba, TC4. Um, so here's our specimen. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we use the ASTM and the ESO standards to carry out tests on four specimens. And the specimen is shown, and we blew on a paper ruler. So you, you can see now that we can follow the delamination tip, and we take uh, images, we capture images with a revision um, camera system. And so we can follow the delamination as it propagates, and we can also follow, and you can see, I hope, the fiber bridging zone. So D is the actuator displacement, and delta naught is the crack opening or delamination opening at the initial delamination tip. And delta A is the crack length extension or delamination length extension. So here we have results from four tests. P, we applied the load. We actually were applying displacement and we're, we're measuring load. And we calcula calculate G1R by means of modified beam theory, which is one of the methods that's suggested in the, in the uh, standards. B is the width of the specimen and delta is a correction factor, which we obtained from the test data. And here is a G1, the G1R curve for our four specimens. And delta A is the crack length extension. So what we're going to do, we carried out the test. We now want to create a cohesive zone model based on these tests. And what we need is a traction separation law. And we look, we assume that there's no shear. There's some shear, but it's, it's minimal, we believe. And so we have sigma, which is the normal stress in the fibers, which are holding together um, the crack or the delamination. 
and delta is the normal separation. So we could have a bilinear traction separation relation where linearly the stress, uh, the stress of the fibers um, uh, goes up linearly to a, a value of sigma max. And at delta is equal to delta C, um, damage starts and we get softening. And we continue to load and delta reaches delta max at which the fiber breaks and there's no more stress uh, exerted in the, um, in the traction separation relation. So under the initial curve, we have G1C, which here, here's our GR curve and G1C is the initial critical stress, um, critical fracture toughness. And then we have delta G1SS. G1SS is the asymptote that it reaches in the G1R delta A curve. And delta G1SS is the difference between them. So we have the area under the curve. We didn't use bilinear curve. It wasn't um, suitable. What we did was we used a linear exponential curve where, again, we load up. We have a, a linear triangle here. And then the stress drops precipitously and we have softening, which is exponentially decaying. And again, G1C is the area in the blue region and delta G1SS is the area in the pink region. So this is our, this is our traction separation relation. So the value of G1R is based on G1C, which is the critical G1R initiation, and G1SS is its steady state value. And we determine G1C from this equation, where R is replaced by C. And here are the values that we obtained and the average value and the standard deviation. And here you can see the G1R curve and as an example, for specimen 37, G1C, you can see the um, diamond-shaped point is 256.4 joules per meter squared. And then we do the same thing for G1SS when it reaches this asymptote. Here are the values for all of the specimens, and here is the average value. And we use these two values in the cohesive zone model because they're the area under the the G1C is the area under the first part of the curve, and delta G1SS is the area under the second part of the curve. And we need other parameters in order to um, prescribe our cohesive zone model. So if we draw G1R now with respect to delta naught, and I remind you that delta naught is the opening uh, at the uh, in initial position of the artificial delamination, and, and we do that so we don't have to watch something that's moving. Uh, we we um, just measure this as it changes. And um, so we, we draw this curve. This is the red, the red curve. And here is delta G1SS. And here is G1SS. And the, we get a fitting parameter. C is 2.601 per millimeter. And we can get delta max from this curve when the red curve reaches 331.8 G1SS, that's our delta max. At that point, we say that uh, fibers are going to begin to break. So now we're going to have to make an assumption. This, this is our G1R curve with respect to delta zero, the opening at the um, initial tip of the, of the delamination. And we can get the softening part is in the literature by Sorensen and Jacobson. If you uh, differentiate um, G1R with respect to delta zero, we can get the soft, sigma B is the softening part uh, of the um, fraction separation law. And so it, they make an assumption, and we made the same assumption, that we can use this expression, this expression for G1R, and replace delta by delta naught by delta. So here we replace delta naught by delta, and this is the softening part of our fraction separation law. 
So this, the area under the, this curve, the pink area is delta G1SS. And this is, this is our curve. And this is the softening part. And of course we can get sigma B max when uh, delta is equal to zero. But what we do is we um, translate the curve because we want to allow for the in initial uh, increase to sigma max. And so this is sigma B max. And so here's our initial response, which is linear. And the area under the curve is G1C. And now we have also the softening part. We chose sigma max to be 25 megapascals because it was convenient and it yielded good results. We were basically, it's a fitting parameter. And so from this equation, we can calculate delta C. So we have sigma B max, delta C, delta max, sigma max. We have G1C, the area under the curve, and we have delta G1SS. So that's basically all we need for the um, fraction separation law. So here it is written as an equation and we use this in, in the analysis in the finite elements analysis. So our composite, here's a DCB specimen. Here is the initial delamination. We have uh, 40,000 plain strain elements. We're using abacus. The material is transversely isotropic. We obtain the mechanical properties from the literature. Um, and we incorporate a user element for the cohesive behavior. And so we have cohesive elements all along um, the interface between the upper and lower arms of the specimen. And so we have a thousand user elements, which are six noted elements with three integration points. And it incorporates the, C, the CZM, the cohesive zone in there. And you can see now um, the propagation, the, the blue area is where the delamination no longer exists. Maybe I'll play it once more. Oops, sorry about that. I guess I can't play it. I should be able to play it once more. Okay, now for perhaps. Okay, so you can see the active zone where we have the cohesive zone and soon the fibers are going to start to break and we have broken fibers and a cohesive zone that's traveling to the right with the tip of the delamination traveling to the right. And so we obtain numerical uh, values of P versus D. D is the actuated displacement P is the, the load. And so the experimental curve is in green. And you see, using our finite elements analysis, we get a very good correlation between the experiment and the finite elements analysis. And for all of the others, we have a pretty good correlation. It's not as good for the specimen DCB as 37, but it's, I think we're very, we're very satisfied with it. And so also our G1R delta A plots, we also numerically simulated them and we get, we're, we're getting very good results. So this cohesive zone is, is able to uh, mimic the, the experiment. And now we're, we're coming to our, our aim. Our aim is to evaluate the contribution of the fiber bridging to our G1R curve. So, G1SS is composed of, first of all, G1C, and then we have what's called delta G other, the other dissipative mechanisms, be they um, such as matrix, um, matrix cracking and so on. And um, we have delta fiber bridging. And what we want to do is we want to evaluate delta fiber bridging, eliminate it, and this is the G1R curve, the red curve, is the G1R curve that our structure is going to feel because it doesn't have fiber bridging in it. So the fiber bridging is an artifact of the DCB test, and we want to subtract it. So we have to evaluate it. So we've evaluated by looking at our traction separation law, and we have delta C, and we have delta max, and we measure 
the five abridging, the maximum opening uh, in the five abridging zone. So here, now we made a, a, a big assumption here, and I'm sure maybe some people won't be so happy with it, but we said our fiber bridging zone is, pa is enclosed in, in our cohesive zone. And um, when we can't see any light through the, through the fibers, we say that's where the fiber bridging zone ends. And here you can see fibers, but they're sparse. And we claim that you can't, um, that, that they do, it doesn't carry that much load. And it's part of the delta of it. Those are the sparse fibers and they carry a small portion of the load. That's our assumption. And the dense fibers carries a large portion of the load. And we obtain the delta FBZ max from the average of four specimens. We actually measure it using uh, the images that we have captured. And so then to get delta FBZ, G FB uh, fiber bridging, we integrate the um, trapped and separation region uh, between this red region between delta C and delta FBZ max. And this is the equation that we substitute in here. We take the, obtain the integral and we find that delta FBZ is 70% of delta G1SS and delta G other is 30%. So we claim that this, we have subtracted off the contribution for fiber bridging in the quasi-static test, and this is the net G1R curve. And what we also did is we tested an additional specimen, not using the derivation of the cohesive zone model, and we get very good results using the cohesive zone model. This is uh, similar to the other specimen, um, S37. So now we get to fatigue delamination propagation, and um, I've I've lost the time, but I think we have we have enough time. Um, in, in this case, again, we want to determine the contribution of fiber bridging to the energy release rate and eliminate it to enable conservative design for structures. So we're going to describe the fatigue delamination propagation behavior using a cohesive zone model approach based on the experimental results and based on our experience with quasi-static testing, except there's going to be more damage here. So we numerically simulate the experiments using the cohesive zone model. We're using, we're in mode one with DCB specimens, and we carried out two specimens where we applied three million cycles at a constant amplitude, and we, these were, displacement control test. We also uh, followed some work that's in the literature where we took one specimen and we carried out five sequences at a constant amplitude and for uh, 100,000 to 300,000 cycles. So we did two types of fatigue tests. And let me just say that the specimens that uh, were cycled at 3 million cycles ran for about nine days continuously. Automatically, we take pictures even in the middle of the night when we're not there. And so here is the, you can see the specimen here that's um, connected to the load cells in the Instron loading machine. And we have all kinds of way, ways of taking pictures. We, we need to um, use light sources and so on. So here you can see the test as it's being carried out. And if we plot P max versus the cycle number for the two tests, this is, is what we see. And if we plot G1 max versus the cycle number for the two tests, we see they're, they're not exactly the same and we don't expect them to be because this is fatigue. And here we're plotting DABN versus G1 max. And these are our two tests and they're separated a bit because of the scatter and fatigue tests. So we expect this variability. So the CZM um, that we created is similar to that of the quasi-static uh, one. Here, here is the basic 
the basic um, a curve, the basic traction separation law, where we now write sigma max f and delta max f. And it has the same shape as the quasi-static test, but um, we have fatigue damage. And we apply fatigue damage to the traction separation law, further degrading it. We have the static damage, with quasi-static damage, which is at, in the softening part, but we even have fatigue damage, which um, decreases this, this curve. And this is just shown schematically that um, a, as we fatigue, the, the curve is, is decreasing. And we have to find parameters that are applicable for this, this fatigue cohesive model. So in addition, I remind you of Harris's law, where DABN is a constant delta K to the power N. And we're using a Paris type relation here, um, where we have the Paris constant D and M. But now we use a modified, for a function of G, we use a modified Hartman-Stiver approach, which was published uh, in the paper noted below where we have the square root of G1 max in the cycle. We find the square root of G1 threshold or G1 threshold. And we also find this parameter A. Um, G1 threshold is the value of G1 below which there'll be no, no, delamination, no delamination growth. And A is the cyclic fracture toughness G1C. It's a measure of the fracture toughness in, in fatigue. It's not G1C. So we have to find A, and, and we do it from the data that, that we have obtained. We have to find A and G1 threshold. And I don't have time to go into the details, so I'm just going to show you the numerical model um, for the tests that were carried out, the 3,000 cycles. Um, we used the the cohesive zone model to, pro to propagate the delamination in fatigue in, in the numerical analysis. And um, we tell you that we used a hyper-elastic hyper isotropic model uh, because there was so much numerical error in carrying out the fatigue in the, uh, in the uh, linear elastic model but what we did was we chose mechanical properties for the hyperelastic uh, isotropic model so that we reduplicated the quasi-static numerical results. And again, we used 40,000 um, eight-noted uh, plane strain elements. And we have our user elements, which are six-noted with three integration points ahead of the frac tip. And we're going to look at the damage. So the damage being one, it means that the fibers are breaking. And when the damage is zero, um, there's no effect here that you can see when the damage which is, is zero. There's no effect on, on the um, model. And so the failed elements damage is one, no damage is blue. And you can see now we carry out in the, um, finite elements, the fatigue propagation. And you, you can see that the, these are the broken fibers. You can see the um, cohesive zone. And there's a fiber bridging zone within the cohesive zone. So now, uh, if we compare the experimental results to the finite element results, and this is Pmax as a function of n, we have very good correlation for specimen S9. And we, we compare G1 max um, versus n. And here is of the ADN versus G1 max curves for these are uh, the ones that, the specimens that went 3 million cycles and we have another set and we get relatively good correlation between the numerical and the experimental results. I will tell you that 3 million cycles are numerically simulated by the
we have to then car own and cycles um, numerically. And then we use another approach. Um, there's a paper by Yao et al. in uh, 2018, where they get an upper, upper bound fatigue delamination propagation rate curve. And this is the one in which we have to do sequencing. We carried out five sequences. So they gave us a method to calculate and eliminate fiber bridging and scab. So DC beach specimens were tested in consecutive fatigue sequences. And this allows us to obtain conservative design parameters. Again, it, uh, it uses one of the heart and spasm modifications, the same one that we used before. And here are the five sequences. Um, we find G1CF, which is A. We find the square root of G1 threshold. And if sequence one is in gray, sequence two is in blue, sequence three is in orange, green, red. And here is our upper bound curve, which eliminates, which they claim eliminates the fiber bridging. So we followed, we followed what they did. And we did something else. We took our fiber bridging model, and I don't know how I'm doing, so Francesco, can you tell me how much time I have left? Okay. Good time. How much? I don't remember your question. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody remember? Five minutes. Somebody tell me for five, five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. I forgot to check my, uh, my watch. Okay, so we have our cohesive zone model, and uh, the, the area under the curve is G1CF. It's different than what we did previous. And we calculate G10 from the sequencing test, which is the area under this curve. And um, and delta GFB fiber bridging is this pink, the pink um, area, and that's what we want to eliminate. And delta G other. So I don't have, we, we integrate this curve, of course we have to get all of, and I'm not going into the details of how we got all of the parameters. We get all of the parameters, and we find out that delta F, FB, the fiber bridging, is 95% of the dissipative, the dissipative, it's, it's much more than in the uh, quasi-static case, and delta G other is 5%. And here you can see the specimen S9, um, the initial curve with the fiber bridging and the curve of Yao uh, in green and our curve in, in purple. Let me just go down to the next one. And, and this is the finite element results with without fiber bridging and the Yao curve. And this is for the other specimen. The, this curve is less conservative than the Yao curve. So that's, that's it. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a method for eliminating. We can use their method or we can use our method. So we now have two methods for eliminating fiber bridging from our fatigue propagation. And so we've reached the summary and conclusions. Uh, we carried out quasi-static fatigue tests on four DCB specimens. The cohesive zone model was developed to describe the delamination propagation behavior based on the test results. The fiber bridging contribution to the fracture resistance curve was determined based on the test results and the cohesive zone model, and it was eliminated from the fracture resistance curve. And a test on a fifth specimen validated the cohesive zone model. And then we did the same, we did similar work for fatigue delamination propagation tests. We carried out two specimens uh, at 3 million cycles and one specimen with the fatigue testing, fatigue sequencing testing that was suggested by Yao et al. And um, we obtained a cyclic fatigue cohesive zone model based on the test results. 
and the fiber bridging contribution to the fatigue energy release rate was determined based on the test results and the cohesive zone modeling fatigue. The fiber bridging contribution was eliminated from the fatigue propagation values leading to faster propagation rate values which better re represent real structures. And the suggested method appears to be less conservative than the Yao model from 2018. And so I just mentioned what um, Francesco mentioned at the beginning, a book on interface fracture and delaminations in composite materials from Springer. And I thank you for listening and I will entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. And uh, we are open to questions, comments. Please, Fadim. Hi, Leslie. Uh, you mentioned that instead of the million of cycles, you've modeled only 80 cycles. So have you used the mass scaling approach, or what was the strategy to reduce the number of the cycles to this level? Um, well, we did, um, we, e each cycle, I, we divided 80 into the 3 million, and so one cycle represented um, whatever that uh, division is, and, um, and, and we're, was we were able in that way to fit the data. 